No, no. So yeah, so we up to yesterday we got to this point um, where we talk about JK flip flops. So JK flip flops are one of the more popular flip flops, and they have two inputs, J input and K input, as well as the clock. Um, so again, this triangle means clock, which means rising edge, in this case, sensitive. So that's sort of showing the clock edge. The JK flip-flop, um, the truth table looks like this. So you might notice it's very similar to the RS, where J is set and K is like reset, with the addition that when J and K are both one, it goes to the toggle state, so the output changes on every clock edge. Um, so I won't go through and map them all. We can create the toggle flip-flop, the T flip-flop, like this. So if you combine the J and K together, then whenever the input's high, the output just toggles on every clock edge. We describe the state transitions um, using this state diagram that we use in finite state machines. So what it's showing is that if we have an on state, we can go, so if we're in one state, depending on the input, our state will change. So you can imagine here we have an on push button, an off push button. Um, and what this is showing is that's the state of on, and this is the state of off, this first one. So if I draw that a little better. Um, so you can see if we're in the on state and you hit the on button, um, nothing happens because we stay in the on state. If we're in the on state and you hit the off button, we move states. If we're in the off state, hit the off button, we stay in the off state. So what this is showing is that the new state depends not only on the input, but on the current state as well, because um, you can do different things depending on the current state. So we can do the same thing with the IRS push button. If you're in the this Q equals zero state and you set S equal to one and R equal to zero, you'll go to the set state. Um, if you're in the set state and both are equal to zero, you'll stay in that previous state, Oops, S is equal to zero. And then we can reset it with R equal to one. Um, and again, if we're in the zero state and R and S are both equal to zero, we'll stay in this state. So the difference here is that for the zero, zero input, your next state depends on the current state. Um, so just like the lamp, when there's no input, if you're in the on state, you continue to be in the on state. If you're in the off state, you continue to be in the off state. So it's not just pure combination. You can't figure out the current state based only on the inputs. You need to remember what the last position you were in. Um, and we'll use what's called a state transition table to describe how we move from state. So you can say, if I'm starting in the state of zero, the current output of Q is zero, I want to be in the, um, the zero output now. Set must be zero. I have no choice. Because if set is one, it's going to move to one. Reset can actually be zero or one. Both cases result in your new state being one. And you can do the same thing. To move to the one state, you need set to be one. To move to the zero state, you need reset to be one. Um, and to stay, stay in the one state or move from one to one, again, um, reset must be zero, and if set is zero, we just stay in that state. If set is one, we move to the one state. So showing that. Um, and you can do the same thing for all of the flip-flops. So for the D flip-flop, the new input is just, the new state is just what is the D input, sorry. So um, JK, again, you can do that same sort of thing. Uh, the JK flip-flop, you notice what changes is these two, with the RS, these were forced to zero. Um, with the JK, because if both inputs are one, you'll toggle. This becomes a don't care, and this becomes a don't care. Um, this will have effects later, because if you use a JK flip-flop, when you do K maps with JK, you get a whole lot of don't cares in your K map, which means you can make really big groups, bigger groups. Um, and you always want to make the biggest possible groups to get the simplest logic. Um, same thing for the T flip-flop. T, you know, we just, if we want to toggle, we set it high. 
And we can then have this master state transition table. So the master table is saying that to create any transition to go from 1 to 0, um, you know, for each type of flip-flop. So for the RS, this is what the input needs to be. For the D, this is it. For the JK, um, you know, a don't care in a 1. For a T, a 1. Where we'll use this table is to convert flip-flop types. So what do I do first, JK with D? So say I had a D flip-flop here. So the only input I have is D. And I want it to behave like J and K. So I want A and B in there to be J, K. So to the user, you know, if I'm currently in the zero state and I put 1, 1 in, the user is then expecting this on the next clock pulse to become 1. Um, so how we do this, and this is showing you again, this is what the user is expecting. If they want to move from the zero state to the one state, they expect that they can have J input of one, and it doesn't matter what the K input is. So we need some logic here to convert the given inputs to the required input. So the given is the user, the required is the flip-flop we have. So we, we have D, um, and we want to make it look like a JK. So we start with that state transition table, draw out um, what you have, so the state transitions and the two flip-flops, um, and change it around a bit. So now we have, um, we've written the current state, we've gotten rid of Q+. Plus. We can do that because each line is corresponding to the same Q+. Plus. Um, so all the logic we write will be dependent on the current state of Q. That's what we know. We don't know what Q plus will be, per se. Um, and we also have the D required output, as well as the J and K. So these are the inputs. So we've deleted the Q plus. Next, we're going to rearrange this, because these are the inputs. Um, these are the inputs. Q is the current state, and J and K are the user inputs, so new inputs. D is what we're going to feed into our flip-flop. So again, remember what we're building here is that combinational logic here. So you're building this logic, and the output is D. The final output will be Q once you implement it. But this is what we're trying to create. Um, so you can create a full-blown truth table if you want. Um, so you can say for each possible input, again, we have some don't cares in the inputs here. So I'm going to enumerate those to give us this final truth table. Um, this final truth table will move to a K map now. So again, I've had that same truth table, JK with D. Um, oh, and I didn't actually write it in. So for example, if I have a 101, 110, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, I already put that one, 100 is also. Um, so you can simplify it maybe like that and like that. So two groups of two. Pretty straightforward. Um, and you can draw the final version if you want. So, you know, you have the D flip-flop here, D input, clock input, um, J and K, and you can say I have Q, Q complement, and I have D equals J and Q complement. Something like that. Or with the other term comes D. Oops. So you just draw it from this. Um, it's going to be messy, but you get the idea. And then this is your final Q outputs and Q complement output. Um, yeah, and then we have the clock input. You always want to draw the clock input because that's what makes it a flip-flop. So you can see this is a JK flip-flop now. Um, second example, other way around, I have a JK flip-flop. I want to make a D flip-flop. Um, when you do this, what you'll notice is you get these don't cares in the truth table. So, again, you have to remember mapping with don't cares means we can simplify more, possibly. You have two outputs here, because there's 
two outputs the intermediate logic is generating. So there's going to be two Kmax, one for each output. Um, when you're doing these don't cares, one sort of, I find faster way to map don't cares, um, especially when we get into the finite state machines, you may have that you don't have every possibility written out here. You know, you have three input variables and in you only have four entries and everywhere else is a don't care. Um, what you can do, for example, is I'll put all the zeros and ones and just leave don't cares blank. So zero, 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 one, zero is one. And for the second output, I have zero, one is one, one, one is zero. Um, the blanks are don't care, so you map there, because these are, and then that's your logic. Um, from there, you can obviously just create the, so we say k is equal to a naught, which is, what I've used here is a naught, which is d. Uh, and you can say j is equal to just a, which is equal to D. Um, again, it's normally, if you're drawing these, you could write directly, this is A, this is Q. Um, and then you can see all you have to do now is wire that up with a NOT gate. Um, there's the conversion process written out. So, next thing. Serial. Um, so most of this stuff, or all of this stuff, is fairly basic. Um, the serial stuff, we had this idea of registers. Registers are basically just D flip-flops, and you can see I've connected all of the clocks together. So here I have a four-bit register. So this is four bits. One, two, three, four. Um, every time the clock goes high, those four bits are going to be updated. Uh, again, you can just drop down registers in the design software we have. Four input bits, one clock. Shift registers are a version of this where we connect the inputs and outputs together like this in a serial fashion. Um, so the shift register, you can see on every clock pulse what's going to happen is that, say initially we have zero here, zero here, zero here, zero here and say this inputs one. When the clock goes high, so the clock's gonna go high everywhere at the same time, and we can start with this furthest over uh, D flip-flop. When this clock goes high, this zero is gonna be propagated through here, so this will become zero, so zero goes there. In the same way, this zero is going here, this zero is going here, and this one is going here. So you have to remember that this all happens at the same time. This means the one isn't instantly propagated through the whole thing because at the instant that this flip-flop here is reading the input, it's zero. So it's not the new state, which is one. It's the old state, which is zero. Then on the next, assuming we stay to keep that at one, um, We'll use purple. So we're say it goes to zero now. Again, everything's going to propagate through. And again, you can draw either direction. So here I'm going to draw this way. Zero there, one there, zero here, zero here. So you see how we take the old state and update to form the new state. So at this point, the outputs will be zero, one, zero, zero. And you can see this one will get shifted through. So we call it a shift register. For that reason, every clock, it's just moving one more. Um, so you can imagine something like if we have a data input and a clock input like this, uh, what you'll see is that here the data input at this edge is 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. So again, it's just at the clock edges. Um, at the first clock pulse, now, assuming this was all zero, 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 what you would see is, um, oops, yeah, okay, now I was checking ahead. So what you would see here is, let me just erase this all. 
at first it'll go, if it starts at 0, 0, 0, 0, the first clock it's going to go to 1, 0, 0, 0. The next clock, this 1 is going to move over here, and the new input will be this 1, so that 1. The next clock, again, these two bits are going to shift over, move over, and then the new input will be this one. At this clock here, where the input's zero, again, these old ones will shift over, and the new input will be that zero. So we have this same movement through where data, old data, is shifting in like that. So again, everything you can see how the one is moving over, the zero moves, one moves, etc. Um, so that's what we call a shift register. And of course, with the flip flops, remember this dot, logic dot, means invert, which means this is now negative edge trigger. So whatever data is present on the falling edge becomes what's shifted in. And again, we can just drop down those types of flip-flops, or those serial-to-parallel shift registers. Uh, serial protocols, in general, we call it a serial protocol because there's the one line, one wire, data is transferred serially, so one bit at a time. You have questions of how you send the data, uh, most significant bit or least significant bit first. So this is to say if I'm sending the number 1010, which is what we would call 10 in decimal. Uh, there's a question, what do I shift out first? Do I shift out the zero? So on the wire, do I get zero, one, zero, one? So this is the first bit, second bit, third bit, fourth bit, which would be LSB first. Or do I shift this bit, so the MSB first, one, zero, one, zero. And this would be MSB first. You'll have questions around how many bits are transferred at once, how long the data is, and what other lines you have to control it. So one we use in class, and one of the more common ones, Serial Peripheral Interface, SPI, or pronounced SPI, is, has four lines, data in, data out, clock, and what they call a slave select, which is an enable line. So it looks something like this. If you have two devices, we have a clock, you have data. Uh, so this data is what is being sent from the master to the slave. So you know it will send maybe a one and a zero at some point, and a one, maybe another one. Um, what the slave is sending back to the master and the slave select. So the slave select is an enable line, as I said. And it looks something like this, for example. So we can have a, the slave select goes low, it's active low, so that means I'm going to send you some data, the master says, and then on each clock edge here, we're sending some new data. And you have, op, you can use either rising or falling edge, I think we use all rising edge. So you can see cycle one, data bit one, data bit one, data bit two, two, etc. I squared C is a, another very popular one. It only has two lines as the advantage, and they're, it uses a bidirectional data line. So this is when we talk about tri-state uh, buffers. Stuff like this is an example of sort of applications of that. With I squared C, again, you send the clock on each clock edge. You are sending a bit. Instead of sending bits both ways at once, one way sends and then the other way sends. Asynchronous serial, this is sort of a serial port on your computer. This is what you would use. This is a bit different because there's only two lines, data in, data out, there's no clock line. It's called asynchronous because there's no explicit clock sent with it. This is asynchronous means that synchronous has the explicit clock. So with asynchronous, there's some requirements around you need to synchronize the clocks and make sure they're synchronized. So you send typically some number of start and stop bits, uh, which are special patterns that the receiver, the transmitter sends and the receiver recognizes to check that they've received the frame correctly. If these look skewed, so for example, if the receiver sees the stop bit at an unexpected time or 
takes too long, they know that their clocks might be off. USB, universal serial bus, is also a serial protocol. It uses two differential data lines. Uh, again, it's similar in idea to this. It doesn't send an explicit clock. It uses what is effectively one data line. Um, there's two physical wires because it sends everything in differential. So one line is always the opposite of the other line. So when one line is low, the other line is high. So, you know, D plus and D minus might look something like this. And there's advantages, analog advantages to this in terms of how much emissions you radiate and sort of speeds you can get up to. So I'll start through. At some point, we're going to be stopped to do evaluation, potentially. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so we have an application of flip-flops is counters. Let's see. So counters can be used to count, surprisingly. And there's a few different ways and uses for them. One of them is what we call this divide by n counter. We can build this with T or toggle flip-flops. And what you can see is I've tied the toggle input high to each of them. So you can imagine that when this guy, this clock input will go something like this. When it goes high, the output, it's, this output will switch. So it goes, you know, if it was high, it goes low. It doesn't switch again until the next rising edge. So what this is going to do is basically create this divide by two. So you can see here, for example, if I have this input clock, so this is clock in the figure, on this rising edge, the output toggles. It doesn't toggle again to the next rising edge. But each time it toggles, it's just going from high to low or low to high. So this has the effect of dividing the clock by two. So you can see how on, oops, on each rising edge, the output toggles, which is creating this divide by two. And the same thing, I just wire this clock output to what is effectively the next stage. Um, and as it's going through, each one is dividing that by two. So you can divide by two, by four, by eight. We can build that with D flip-flops as well. This is showing that. So again, we have a clock input here. And the input to it is just simply the current state fed back with an inverter. And this is the exact same system we're creating as the divide by n with a T or toggle flip-flop. Where we use them is in stuff like watches. This is popular because you have this 32, this crystal oscillating at 32768 hertz, 32,768 hertz. And if you divide that by 300, 32,768, you get a one hertz clock. That is to say every second. So the second hand, you can use that to um, say when to move the second hand. This number is a power of 2, which is why it's useful. It's 2 to the power of 15. So we can create a divide by 32,768 um, counter just by using 15T flip-flops. So, yeah, it's, and there's some trade-off because you can only have a crystal oscillate. A, a, so there's sort of a lower limit to the frequency. And this is a trade-off between complexity of needing a lot of flip-flops and crystal size. So we can create a counter that counts in binary. That is, it goes 0, 1, 2, up to 15, and then repeats. We can do this with toggle. Here I'm showing it with JK. This is the same thing, remember. Toggle flip-flops tied together. And each of these outputs is just one bit, so Q1, Q2, Q3. And you notice that what I've done is I've connected the Q complement output, not the Q output, to the clock input here. Um, so when we look at the, oops, the diagram of this, this is showing that implementation. Uh, you can see, for example, we started at 0, 0, 0. And again, this is the clock here. So then we go 1, 0, 0, 1, or 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. Um, oops. Zero. Oh yeah, zero, zero, one, so four. So you can see that it's counting up as we expect it to be. 
And this is what we call a ripple counter. It's called a ripple counter because you notice there's one clock input here, and then the rest of these outputs are rippling through. It's, it's connecting the outputs to the clock inputs. The disadvantage of this is that it actually takes time for this to ripple through. So this changes, and then this changes, and then this changes. So we have delay. You know, if you have 15 or 16 of them together, what you're going to get is that that ripple, even though it only takes maybe 4 nanoseconds for one of them, at the end of the chain, if you have 10, 40 nanoseconds, if you have 15, something more than that, 80, you know, 60 nanoseconds, to, uh, to ripple through. So there's an upper limit how fast you can run, and it slows down as you add more bits. So we have an update to that called the synchronous counter. And the synchronous counter, the idea is that they are all synchronized. They all have one clock input here. Um, and on every rising edge, each flip-flop is doing something. For this to work, you can't just connect them together. It won't work like we had before. We need some additional logic. Um, and that additional logic is that you sort of can notice when does, for example, this bit, this bit's always toggling. So you can guess that I, if I tie this high, that'll cause that bit to always toggle. When does this bit toggle? This bit toggles after the previous bit was high. So you can say, well, in this case, I can actually just connect that together. But when does this bit toggle? This bit toggles, so here it's going from 0 to 1, only when the previous two bits are 1. Here it goes to 0 when the previous two bits are 1. So you can start to create the logic, for example, for Q2 is just and of these bits, because I want Q2 to toggle when Q0 and Q1 is high. In the same way, it'll be Q3 toggles when Q2, Q1, and Q0 are all high. So this is creating the three input and gate. And you can just keep extending that. So this is a synchronous counter. It doesn't suffer from, from the same problem, because each output is always updated four nanoseconds after this, you know, say it was four nanoseconds, I'm making that up, but if we had a if we had a clock here, so when that clock goes high, each update is always updated at the same time. It doesn't matter if you have four or if you have four hundred bits. They all update at the same time. It's not the case with the ripple counter. So the synchronous counter gives you much higher clock speeds, especially as the number of bits increases. Um, some additional counter types, ring counter, this one, you always have a 1, so you notice I've set up a reset to create this, and on every clock pulse, it just moves that 1 around. So something like this looks familiar probably now that we've done state machines to the 1 hot type encoding, because it's just moving around in a ring. There's always one bit. Um, the design procedure for them... You start with a design spec, so you say, I want it to count through this sequence. You create a state transition diagram, so you say, oh, it's going to count like this. You write the state transition table, which is just to say, in this case, I go 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. Oops, is that? Oh, I went backwards in my example. Yeah, so again, the design procedure is very similar to with a finite state machine. Um, actually, maybe I'll skip this part and just go to the finite state machine because that might be more useful. Yeah, exactly. So So finite state machines have a similar idea to the arbitrary counters in that you can use them to move between a number of states. And you can think of the states as being like a counting. 
So when we're doing this, there's some steps to it. The first one is always understanding the problem. You might not be given the problem in a defined way. So you might not be told explicitly these are all the states you need. You may be, in which case understanding it's easier. You can then draw the initial state diagram and then from that minimize it. So the example I had given is that if you had a vending machine, you might initially come up with the idea, well, I'll just use a state for every possible way you could make you know, $1.25. But you're going to have a lot of states because you know you have stuff like this. So you're going to have all these different states. Compared to if you simplify it and you just have the state represent the amount of money that's currently been inserted, you can then make it a lot easier because you can say, okay, if I have a quarter, I move to that. If I'm in the quarter state and I get a quarter, I move to that. If I'm in the quarter state and I get a loony, I move to that. And if I'll just do these all quarters. And if they insert too much money, so if they insert loonies, it always just jumps to the final state. And there's no change given in this state machine. It's great for the owner, less great for people using it. And I haven't shown if it doesn't move, then if it zeroes, then it stays in the current one. And there should be a, from here, if you insert a dollar, you go to the one dollar. Oh, hey. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, so I'll go through an example from assignment five instead of planned slide examples. You can go through the examples on the slides, but uh, this will give you something a little different to work with. Um, so in assignment five, we'll do this first part A, um, because I believe it's, yeah, part A here. So in assignment five, you're given this question that says design a finite state machine, FSM, for controlling the lamp. And the basis of this is given in these slides here. And I say, OK, if you had a lamp, you may have this situation here where you're in the on state and you're in the off state. You have a, you have a switch, an on switch. You have an off switch. And when the on switch is hit, you move from the on to the off state. When the off switch is hit, you move from the off to the on state. I think I said that right. And I also, besides just the lamp, I want a buzzer. And I only want the buzzer to buzz when the light changes. So if it's in the on state and you hit the button, you hit the on button, nothing happens. Or, you know, you're holding down the on button. It should switch to the on state and buzz once quickly, and that's it, not continue to buzz. So to do this, there's two ways of doing it. We describe two different machines. There's the Mealy machine and the Moore machine. And what the difference is, if when I design this, the Moore machine, I create states for each output combination. So here, light is on, buzzer is off. Here, light maybe the light's turning on now, the light's on, the buzzer is on. Here, the light is off, the buzzer is off. Here, Again, I have this intermediate state where the buzzer is on, maybe the light's still off, before it finally moves to the state that the light's on and the buzzer's off. So I have one state for each output. The output depends solely on the state, nothing else but the state. In the mealing machine, it depends on more than just the um, current state. It depends on the input logic as well. So with this ma state machine, what it means is that, for example, when I press, if I'm in the on state and I press the off button, as long as I'm in the on state and the on button is pressed, the buzzer will be sounding. But at the same time, I also move to the off state. Once I'm in the off state, the buzzer goes off. So this is what we call a mealy machine because the logic will depend on both the current state and the input logic. Um, so I don't think, if I have an example here, so on a more machine, as I had said, you notice if I have this output state here, it depends only on the current state. So, you know, there might be, there's going to be additional state registers normally. Normally there's more than the one and, you know, it could go somewhere else. But with the Mealy machine, what you have is I have this input A, and as soon as that input changes, you can sort of see it winds its way through to the output through that AND gate. 
So as soon as the input changes, the output changes. It doesn't matter. The state hasn't changed yet. Um, so in this case, it's asynchronous because it's not dependent on the clock. In the more machine, we have a synchronous output because the state is only and the output's only changing with the clock. Um, you can with the mealy machine, you can make the output synchronous, but still be a mealy machine. So it's not a condition that you have asynchronous output. But in this case, it's still dependent on the input only, or not only, but in addition to the state. And um, so before the state changes, potentially your output can change. So let's go through this design example um, where I have given you this state transition diagram. So I said, this is what I want it to be. I want there to be a buzzer, and it buzzes while we transition. So we did draw the diagram. You can then make the state transition table for the mealy machine. So if we're in the initial state of zero, and basically when you press the on button, in that case, I want it to go to the next state of one. And when we're in the off state, if you are in the on state, you press the off button, the next state of zero. Um, you can then fill in where it's going to stay in the same state, here and here. So if you do nothing or you press the button representing the state already, it does nothing. Um, and if we're in the initial state of zero and we press both buttons at once, I mean, realistically this won't happen. You can either force it to some state or leave it as a don't care. I'm just going to force it to stay in the same state. Um, it's not necessarily what you have to do because I never showed that on the transition table. I never described what happened. Um, and here, the lamp state depends only on the state, even though it's merely, but this is what we have. And it's the buzzer that depends on both the state and the inputs. So the buzzer logic would look something like that. So there's that written there. Um, again, for the more, the buzzer would only be going for these intermediate states because it depends only on the current state, not the inputs. So there's the state transition table we're going to use. Now, the next step of the design procedure, once you have the state transition table, if we go back here a bit, hope it doesn't crash, is we have this. Now we choose a flip-flop. Again, I'm going to use D flip-flops that we've always used for design convenience. You can use others. Um, I think you'll find, for example, JK typically is more requires more time in the design process, but it's simpler logic. And then we implement it. So what we're going to do is use the state transition tables to create k-maps. So when we do this, I'll switch to the solutions here. And actually in this, oops, that's one, there's two. So 2a. Um, we were given from the slides, we have this. So this is the state transition table that I gave you. And you basically can just draw out the K-map. So the K-map is given there, and you just assign to each group. So you group them together. So A to C complement, A and B, blah, blah, blah. And you can do the same thing for the buzzer output to give you some final logic. So we have the logic given there. When you're drying it out, you may find it easier and cleaner. Um, this is also totally valid because all I've done is I've labeled the net. So I've said A and all the A's connect together and showed some inverters on the AND implicates. So when you're doing this, this will be a time saver if you have to draw schematics. And I recommend doing that way instead. Um, so the other thing I'll show you is one thing I had said before is that you may be given a state. So here's another example. Part C of the assignment asks you to do it with one hot encoding. With one hot encoding, this is the state transition table I have. So um, what we have here is that when I start in the 0, 1 state, I stay in the 0, 1 state unless we hit the on button, I move to the 1, 0 state. In one hot, those are the only two valid states. The other states are totally not allowed. So when I've drawn the diagram, I haven't shown what happens. If it's in the zero, zero state, 
what's the new state? I don't care. If it's in the one one state, what's the new state? I don't care. I assume there's some reset logic that's driving it to one of the valid states. When you do the kmap then, um, this is what I said before, that I find it more convenient in a case like this to put all the ones and the zeros in. Normally you just put the ones. Because everything that I haven't explicitly constrained now shows up as don't cares in this. Uh, so everything that I haven't explicitly gone through and said, what is the state? Do I care? Do I not care? No, I do not care. And drawn those in, I've just said, this is everything I know. Everything I don't know appears as blanks. Um, and then when you do this again, you absolutely want to make the groups as big as possible. Because when you do that, they're going to be as simple logic as possible. Um, so you can see in the second part, for example, or even in this first part, where I have this one here and this one here, rather than making a group of two, I've made a group of four by including those don't cares. Um, and same thing for sort of the output logic, you want to make them as big as possible. And this will result in a lot simpler logic. In question one, so this is the counter design again. Counter design, exact same thing as a state machine. The only difference is there's no input logic. That's what differentiates them. Um, so with the counter design, when I do the JK, again, we have this situation where there's a number of don't cares. Um, so for all of the transitions that I haven't shown, I don't care what happens. When you're doing this, what you might find a lot more convenient, especially for going through, is I've only put those conditions I care about because I explicitly no, everything else is don't care. So now there's only the four entries in the table. Um, I'm missing the other eight, obviously, or the other four to create eight that I need for three input variables. Um, but when I do the k-maps, again, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to put everything, ones and zeros, in the k-map, and the result is blanks are don't cares. Blanks can be made into ones. So when you do this mapping, you want to make them as big as possible, even as in these examples where it's just the inputs of one, because it's a whole solution of everything. So all of those become one. Um, so in that case, some of these, like the J and K, are just both driven to one. So again, that's showing you there's one here. I make a huge group as possible. And that's how we would implement it. So it becomes very simple to implement. Uh, and again, for the counters, once you have the counters written out, you need to check if it's self-starting. To do that, I start with the ABC, and then I go back to the K-maps, and I put in what have I assigned to be 1. So here, I've assigned those to be 1. Let's see if I can draw on this. So if I assign this to be 1, here, this means that's one, that's one, this is one. Oops. Again, all of these are now one. So what I know is that, for example, if A, B, C is zero, one, one, A, B, C is zero, one, one, previously, what um, J, A was set to for zero, one, one, no, previously it was set to 1, is that right? Oh yeah, so sorry, 0, 1, 0, say, not 0, 1, 1. 0, 1, 0, it's a don't care because it's not even a valid state. Or for, say, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, it was previously a don't care. Now I've explicitly assigned it to 0 because it's not within that group. So you can see what the explicit assignments are. You have to take those assignments back and put them back in your table. So now you can see I no longer have don't cares. I have every possibility listed. Um, and what this means is that now I'm explicitly saying if I start in the you know, 001 state, which was a don't care, JA is 0, KA is 0. Again, this is based on the K-maps I've created. And the new state of A will then be 0, because if it's 00, zero it stays the same. And you can do the same thing going through each one. So for JB and KB, it's always toggling, so it becomes a 1. And for C, it's 1, 0, results in a 1, because it's going to set the output, the output's already set. Um, once you do this, this is where we get the complete 
counter table. So you can see if I start in you know zero 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 state, it's going around as expected. We have these additional don't care states. This is how you verify if it's self-starting. So for these states, what's happening is you can see, for example, it starts in the one one zero, which I didn't explicitly design to be anything at all. I just say if it starts in that state, it then goes it goes to this next state based on the logic I've made. And then it gets into the proper count sequence and starts going around. So it is self-starting. Again, if it's not self-starting, it's something like if these additional states here, um, so say 0, 0, 1 is an invalid state. So what I'm expecting to do is this. After you're done, you potentially could have something like this. And it's not self-starting because if it gets into those states, it just forever stays out of the proper count sequence. So, with the state machine, uh, there's a choice of encoding. So, So there's a choice of encoding. When we say encoding, what we mean is when I drew, or when I chose the states, what was I using to choose this? So binary encoding is where I just assign it binary 0, binary 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. So the first state 0, the second state 1, third state 2. Um, and binary encoding is straightforward for us as designers because you can just say that's state one, that's state two, that's state three. And that's one of the big advantages of it is just its simplicity there. Um, another version we might use is called one-hot encoding. One-hot encoding is where only a single one is high at a time. The advantage of one-hot encoding, especially for certain designs, is that for the output logic, all you need to do is you need to look at a single variable. So you look at that one oops, that one bit of the state, and you say, if that bit is one, we are in state four. In state four, the output is something specific. Uh, so it's very straightforward and very simple for the output logic. This simplicity means it actually runs much faster. So the primary advantage of one-hot encoding is your state machine can run a faster clock. Gray encoding is another type you might run into. In gray encoding, this means that only a single bit changes between state transitions. So when I go from this state to this state, again, the gray code that we talked about before means only a single bit at a time is changing. So you can see that in all of these transitions, only a single bit is changing. So you have to look at every possible transition there and see that only a single bit changes. So this means, for example, if I was going from 1, 1, 2, 0, 0, the problem is that the transition you know, will happen something like that. And there's this intermediate time where the state would be read as 0, 1. And that would be not gray encoded. And this is obviously bad, because your output logic will act upon that brief moment when it's 0, 1. Because we have that combinational output logic that's acting and can cause some unintended consequences. We'll use gray coding, because now, when it's going, for example, from 0, 0 to 0, 1, it'll look like that. And there's no way for this intermediate value to exist, because only one bit's changed at a time. All right, so that's basically the end of the ultra-brief summary of the course. So as you can see, the, the k-mapping stuff is quite important, especially around um, some of the sequential stuff, so the state machine. If you can do state machines, you can do counters. So counters are just basically state machines without the inputs and as an introduction. It's also worth knowing how to use the... It's definitely worth knowing sort of how do we use the flip-flops and convert them to different types. So we have this state transition table, and you should have an idea sort of what it means in that the same transition is showed in different flip-flops. 
and then how we use that table to do some simple conversions. And again, the whole point of this is all we're saying is if we're given one type of flip-flop, what logic is needed to generate another type of flip-flop. Um, within flip-flops, that's sort of some of the main stuff is if you really understand that state transition table, you can basically understand flip-flops and how they work. And also within that is sort of knowledge of the fact of how these don't cares play into different flip-flop types and how, for example, with a JK, you use these don't cares because it simplifies the logic because there's lots of states that it doesn't matter what the input is when you design it. So any other specific questions? I mean, I think from, from the stuff today, that's what we've mostly covered is knowing the flip-flops and how, this, how you use the state transition table, what it means, and the finite state machines. Within those two things, sort of if you understand those, that encompasses a lot of all the other material and should give you a good 